Hola, hola. Arlene. Hola, Arlene. Hola, hola a todos. Hola. hola. Hola, eh, buenas tardes a todos. Vamos a, a esperar un par de minutos que se a, acabe de conectar la gente que está conectándose y empezamos. Entonces, deme por favor un par de minutos. Buenas tardes, Edgar. ¿Qué tal? Hola Doc, ¿cómo está? Buenas tardes. Hola V, María, ¿cómo están? Roberto. ¿Qué tal Doc? ¿Cómo está? Oh, no malo. ¿Tú? Lo veo bastante bien, ¿eh? Sí, estoy casi vertical. Casi perfecto, doctor. Sí. V, yo les aviso cuando estemos listos en YouTube, por favor, para iniciar. Muy bien, César. César, ¿cómo vamos? Un minutito más está haciendo el enlace. Gracias.
Eh, muy buenas tardes a todos. Estamos eh, nada más eh, esperando que el enlace de la transmisión en YouTube quede, quede alineado para comenzar. Eh, entonces les agradezco mucho su paciencia. Está un poco lento el acceso al servicio de YouTube, pero lo estoy este, tratando de conectar. Tim, tu oficina es ahí mismo en la universidad, en, 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 en la Universidad de Texas. Uh, en realidad, esta oficina está más o menos a siete millas, millas de, uh -huh. de la, del campus central que está en, en el centro. Y vis, visitó... <risa> una vez cada mes. Es, estamos aquí en un campus mucho más grande con geología y otros. No estoy seguro uh, qué tipo de investigaciones hay en otros edificios, pero hay muchos, varios actividades. Y estás a gusto en Texas. No. No, <laughs> la clima es, es horrible. <laughs> You're always welcome to come back. Puedes, puedes regresarte. <laughs> es como es como un vivero aquí. ¿sí? Okay. Muy húmedo, muy y muy caliente. Ahora hasta octubre, entre mayo y octubre es casi no vale la pena ir afuera, sí. Bueno, entonces ya sabes te entiendo, que Tim. mandé. Te entiendo. <risa> pero, pero tu clima dice, Ay, dice la de Hermosillo. Tu clima es seco. Seca. Ah, bueno, eso sí. <risa> sí. Aquí es. No, no estoy acostum... acostumbre. Acostumbrado. Acostumbrado a la clima de Texas. Miles de veces mejores los 50 grados secos de Hermosillos que no los 35 o 38 con una humedad del 190% sí. de, de ese hoyo que es Texas, ¿no? Sí. Es horrible. No sé, los veo a ustedes muy cómodos hablar desde la tranquilidad del centro de México sobre el clima de Hermosillo. Así que... No, pues no. mira, vete, vete un mes, vete ahorita a Texas un mes y luego verás que regresas corriendo a Hermosillo. No, gracias. Bye. Ah. Ok, este bueno, ya tratamos no sé. el tema del clima. No, no sé eh, qué les parece pues, si, si empezamos si comenzamos, ahora sí. porque no veo progreso lo, con la colección de YouTube. Entonces, de nuevo, eh, buenas tardes a todos. Bienvenidos a otro de los eh, seminarios que organizó el doctor Martens conmigo para presentar el volumen especial de la Sociedad Geológica de América 
uh, número 546, que es un, un, un volumen que trata sobre, como dice el título, Southern and Central Mexico Basement Framework Tectonic Evolution and Provenance of Mesozoic Cenozoic Basins. Entonces, eh, en este volumen especial eh, hay un artículo que, en el que son coautores el doctor eh, Lotton, V. Martens y María Isabel Sierra, que eh, pues nos va a presentar el, el senior author Tim Lotton. Antes de eso, yo creo que Tim Lotton ya lo conocen eh, muchos de ustedes. Eh, Tim, pues... Eh, Después de una eh, carrera muy larga en la Universidad Estatal de Nuevo México, eh, vino a, a nosotros, vino al Centro de Geociencias en 2012, eh, ya en, en, habiéndose retirado de, de Nuevo México. Eh, nada más un dato interesante, desde su retiro, eh, Tim ha publicado casi 80 artículos. ¿verdad? Así es que eh, él ha estado todo menos retirado, ha estado muy activo, sigue muy activo. Eh, nosotros siempre hemos estado muy agradecidos, tanto los que colaboramos con él en el Centro de Geociencias como los estudiantes que, que trabajaron con él y, y quiero aprovechar para darle las gracias. Entonces, eh, saben que en estas conferencias eh, les sugerimos que eh, si tienen preguntas las, las hagan en el, en el chat ¿verdad? y al final se las eh, presentemos a, a Tim. Entonces, eh, eh, Tim, si quieres por favor compartir eh, tu pantalla y eh, Tim eh, nos va a presentar lo que es una a, a correlación estratigráfica ¿verdad? del carbonífero al paleógeno de México, el suroeste de Estados Unidos, Centroamérica y Colombia. Tim eh, eh, dijo que nos va a dar la charla en inglés, porque si no, en español va, va a tomar un poco más de tiempo. Entonces, eh, la charla es en inglés. Si tienen alguna pregunta por ahí, este, mientras presenta Tim, eh, eh, los invito a que la pongan por ahí entonces en el chat. Entonces, de nuevo, bienvenidos. Muchas gracias. Ya estamos contigo. So, Tim, uh, you can start uh, when, whenever you're ready. Okay. Muchas gracias, Roberto, y buenas tardes a todos. Me da mucho gusto para ver uh, las pantallas y la, los nombres de colegas, estudiantes y, y amigos de, de México. Y, uh, lo siento de hablar en, en inglés, pero pienso que necesito... Uh, un poco demasiado de tiempo en, en, en español porque estoy un poco afuera de práctica en, en, en mi español. So, voy a empezar a, ahora. Ok, so the title of the talk is essentially the title of the paper in the special volume that uh, Roberto mentioned, and I believe you've seen several other talks regarding papers in this uh, in this volume. Does it, am I coming across okay, Roberto? Yes, you are, Tim. You are. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, and my co-authors on this are Maria Isabel Sierra Rojas, who is currently in, in Hermosillo, and Uwe Martins, who I'm not really sure where he is right now. Okay, so a summary of this paper is that we created a uh, comprehensive correlation chart of Pennsylvania to Eocene stratigraphic units, principally in Mexico, but ranging from uh, the state of Utah in the southwestern United States all the way to Colombia. And by means of local stratigraphic columns from each of these places, The chart summarizes um, published data as well as a little bit of unpublished data or previously unpublished data. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, and what we were 
what we're doing here in correlating is we're matching units from various places in terms of their ages of the sedimentary strata and some igneous rocks as well. And the, the, the paper contains brief stratigraphic descriptions that complement um, each column of the chart. And I need to acknowledge, we need to acknowledge uh, just un montón de colegas y estudiantes who helped um, assemble this knowledge of the stratigraphy of, of a really large region. And one thing I want to say about this chart, this, this correlation exercise, is it's a work in progress. It will never be finished because new data are coming in every day. And if people find things they don't like about this chart, I would love to hear about it because I will constantly update it and then pass it off to Maria Isabel or somebody who will, can keep it moving forward. Okay. I'm going to end the show for a second, Roberto, because I can't advance it for some reason. Okay, this is one of two figures in the, in the paper that Maria Isabel put together, and it shows the locations of the various columns that, that we present in the correlation chart. And you can see they run from up here in the Southwestern United States and Baja, the Baja Peninsula, all the way south through Mexico and into uh, Guatemala. And finally, um, we have columns in Colombia as well. I think maybe it doesn't like my laser pointer. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go back to a regular pointer here. Okay, so this is the correlation chart. And um, an important point to make is that part of the data repository in this paper has a full size high resolution um, version of the column, or if, if that is unsatisfactory, I can send them to you directly. But what that uh, chart consists of is 31 columns of, that display the chronostratigraphic correlation of Mississippian through Eocene strata. And as I mentioned before, the columns are distributed from the Baja Peninsula and the Colorado Plateau to Colombia. And the dominant uh, depositional environments of the various formations that are correlated here are indicated by patterns in each of the, in each of the blocks. And then there's a color overlay of tectonic events that um, are related primarily to the Gulf of, of California and the Gulf of Mexico and subduction history of Western Laurentia during the Carboniferous and Permian, um, subduction beneath Pangaea during the Permian through Jurassic and subduction beneath North America through from the late Jurassic through the Eocene. So that basically the chart uh, spans the assembly and breakup of Pangaea. Okay. So there's not much to talk about there, is there? Okay, I'm, I'm just kidding. What I'm going to do now is I'm gonna show you how basically we got to this point. And then after that, I'm going to review um, some, some types of stratigraphy. If this is essentially a lecture from my, my stratigraphy class. And then I'm gonna to return to the Jurassic part of these columns, partly because I know something about the Jurassic, or I think I do. And also it's a part of the, of the geologic uh, history of Mexico that seems to uh, excite a lot of um, emotional discussion. So let's just back up and talk a little bit about stratigraphy. And, and I'm gonna talk about four types of, of stratigraphic units. There are lithostratigraphic units, biostratigraphic units, chronostratigraphic units, 
and geochronologic units. So I'm going to take these one by one. Okay, so lithostratigraphy is the study of stratigraphic units on the basis of their physical characteristics. This is basically how we think about stratigraphic units when we make a geologic map. We just look at them and decide which formation we're in on the basis of what it looks like. And obviously this is a photograph from the Colorado Plateau. It's one of the best places in the world to um, talk about lithostratigraphy. And basically when I talk about the Chinle formation, or the Wingate sandstone, I am implicitly talking about lithostratigraphic units. And we can correlate lithostratigraphic units. Here's a litho correlation of those two units. Here's the Wingate, and here's the Chin Li, um, correlated on the basis of their characteristics between about the Green River in Utah and the Uncompagre uplift in Western Colorado here. Here's the state line between Utah and Colorado. And it's interesting, you can see not much happens between the two localities for the Chinle and the um, and, and the Wingate. But if we if we go below it or above it, we can see very important changes. For example, this unit in the um, called the Moenkopi formation is quite thick in Utah and it's gone. It's it 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 is missing. Um, in the Uncompagre uplift in Colorado. And we see a similar thing here taking place in the Navajo sandstone in the Carmel formation. They go away. So there must have been, there must have been some sort of tectonic activity that took place during the deposition of the Moenkopi, and then again later during the deposition of these later sandstones. But we, we don't really, unless we know the ages of those formations, we don't really know when that happened. This is probably the most famous uh, lithostratigraphy in the world. This is the Grand Canyon. And what we can see here is that simply by looking at the sequence of, of the lithologies, we can tell that uh, there were various events here. We had deposition of this older succession. It was faulted and tilted, and then it was depositionally overlain by a whole younger succession of strata. And this is what they look like. It's, it's obviously a spectacular succession. And so we can build a geologic history here simply by looking at superposition, the placement of unconformities. And, um, but we don't necessarily know when those events took place. So we have to add a couple of other um, types of stratigraphy to this mix in order to get a better idea of the geologic history. And we start with biostratigraphy here, and this is um, the characterization, definition, and correlation of rock units on the basis of their fossil content. And when we talk about biostratigraphic units, we're talking about um, divisions of the, of the stratigraphic section on the basis of changes in species present in the rocks. And it's important to note that um, biostratigraphic units commonly don't correspond at all to lithostratigraphic units. And here's an example of that. Here is a column of lithostratigraphy and we can see that it's, it's divided up into formations. I think this is in uh, uh, New York or, or the upper Midwest, but we see that the formations are then split into members which correspond a little bit more intimately to the lithologic subdivisions of the rocks. But when we look at the um, trilobites that are present in those rocks, we can see that the range of the fossils doesn't correlate very well with the lithostratigraphy. Okay, so there, there's a big difference between stratigraphic units that are defined from their fossil content versus those defined on their lithology. And then we get to something that's really, really critical here. And this is chronostratigraphy. And this is the study of the relationship of stratigraphic units to geologic time. And a chronostratigraphic unit is, is an interval of, of strata that was deposited 
during a specified interval of geologic time. And I've just put the names here, but for example, we would refer to the Jurassic system as the interval of rocks that were deposited during Jurassic time. And I'm part of the reason I'm doing this is because one of the corrections that I make most commonly when I review people's, people's papers on stratigraphy is the misuse of adjectives that refer to these kinds of rocks. These are rocks, not time. And so what we do is we use the adjectives lower, middle, and upper to describe divisions of the Jurassic. For example, lower Jurassic rocks, not early Jurassic rocks, okay? Etch that in your memories. And then finally, there are geochronologic units. And this is, this is critical because this is where we get to geologic time. And these are the more familiar terms like periods and epochs. And when we refer to geologic time, we use the adjectives early, middle, and late to describe, for example, epochs, which are divisions of Jurassic time. So we would refer to early Jurassic time early Jurassic sedimentary basin, early Jurassic fault, early Jurassic paleogeography. I'm on a soapbox now, you can tell. And then finally, we get to the, this a critical um, aspect of geology that we all take for granted, and that is the geologic time scale. And what the geologic time scale is, is a hierarchy of, of global chronostratigraphic units, okay? So these are rocks deposited during certain periods of time. And this, these are type units that are de defined to serve as a standard reference to which we can refer to the age of rock.